Good evening from New York. I'm Chris Hayes. We're three weeks away from the midterm elections. Frankly, we have no idea which party will control the House or the Senate. But what we do know is that there will be enormous consequences for the country either way. You know, elections are run on rhetoric and issues, personality, ads, vibes, like what's going on in the country, how people feel, their mood. But ultimately, the thing we are all deciding as a democratic society is who will wield power and what they will do with that power, on whose behalf they will wield it, in service of what goals they will wield it. Now, we've got a pretty good picture of what this version of the Democratic Party, the current Democratic Party, will do with that power because we've been seeing it over the past two years. Just look at the past two days for just a little example. Uh, one of them, Americans can now buy hearing aids over the counter. This has been a long battle I've covered for years without having to get a prescription from a doctor first which will also bring down the cost of these devices, which are exorbitant. Now, this is thanks to pressure from the Democrats on the FDA. It's been a, a priority of the White House. It says it will, move, it will save American families as much as $3,000 on these devices, okay? That's one thing. Here's another example, last 48 hours. As of yesterday, the application for student debt forgiveness is now live. Most Americans with student loans are eligible for $10,000 dollars in relief from the federal government. Uh, others who uh, were low income at the time they got their loans are available for, can get $20,000. Now, for those who are eligible and watching this and procrastinating, something I tend to do when I have to fill in a web form, it's just about my least favorite thing in the world to do, I have to say, having looked at the form today, it is remarkably simple. So just two concrete recent examples, tangible policy agenda items under Democratic administration under the Biden government. Now, when you're running as the opposition party, as Republicans currently are, you don't have to be that concrete. You can just run against the status quo. You can complain about gas prices and the cost of living. Inflation's 8%. But with Republicans within striking distance retaking the House, probably favored to retake the House, you got to ask yourself, what would that actually mean? Not just on the campaign trail. What would a Republican governance, a Republican majority in the House actually look like? What would they do? And the first thing you need to understand is that it will not look like the last Republican House. The last time Republicans held the House, 2017, 2019, remember, they had unified control of the government. They controlled the House, and the Senate, the White House. Donald Trump was the newly inaugurated president, which means they had an incentive for the government to function, to not cause huge crisis and disaster. They understood, or honestly, at least enough of them understood, that intentionally wrecking the economy, for instance, would not be in their benefit. Donald Trump really got that, actually. There was also the question of who was who using who last time around. I mean, was Trump using the Republican establishment, the Mitch McConnells of the world, or was Mitch McConnell and the Republican establishment using Trump? Because remember, in that period of unified governance for the Republicans, the Trump administration, right, that Congress did not really accomplish any of Trump's big priorities. He couldn't even get Congress, his Congress, with Republicans to fund his border wall, his signature political issue. This is even as he threatened to shut down the rest of his party's priorities over it. Build that wall. Now, the obstructionist Democrats would like us not to do it, but believe me, if we have to close down our government, we're building that wall. It is desperately needed. We're going to have our wall. We're going to get our wall. Now, part of the problem was he promised for two years that Mexico would pay for it, which it didn't, which meant that we all had to. <laughs> and he didn't really get his wall. Instead, in the big major legislative pushes, Republicans did what Mitch McConnell, Washington lobbyists, and rich GOP donors wanted. They do what they always do. What, what is it? They cut taxes for the rich. They cut taxes for corporations. And they spent months bogged down trying to repeal Obamacare, which they ultimately failed to do. So that was the last time, but different this time. Because if Republicans take back the House, first of all, the establishment will not be nearly as powerful as it was back then. The new House will be a party of Republicans who want to wreak havoc, who want to destroy American institutions, who operate on trolling and low trust just for the sake of it. This is the party of Matt Gates, Lauren Boebert, Jim Jordan, and of course, Marjorie Taylor Greene. But here's the other thing you gotta keep in mind. With a presidential election coming up and Joe Biden in the White House, it will be in the short-term interests of the Republican House to make conditions in the country as bad as possible. It's just simple. 
the worse things are for the country while Joe Biden is president, the better Republicans have a shot at retaking the White House in 2024. So a Republican House, yes, they will pass massive tax cuts for the rich. They will pass, I think, a national abortion ban for the first time. They will cut or eliminate entitlement programs, which they're already talking about doing. But with Joe Biden holding veto power in the White House, Republicans will not be able to enact their entire dream agenda. So what does the House of Representatives actually look like with Republican leader Kevin McCarthy in charge and Joe Biden in the White House? Well, first, there will be a dangerous showdown over the debt ceiling, with Republicans once again essentially strapping a suicide vest on to hold the entire economy hostage in exchange for massive cuts to social spending programs. I'm not making this up. Listen to Kevin McCarthy. He all but said so today in the interview with Punchbowl News. I quote him here. If people want to make a debt ceiling for a longer period of time, just like anything else, there comes a point in time where, okay, we'll provide you more money, but you got to change your current behavior. We're not just going to keep lifting your credit card limit, right? And we should seriously sit together and figure out where we can eliminate some waste. Now, <laughs> that's the gentle version. To be clear, by eliminate some waste, I don't know. He can mean cutting Social Security and Medicare. Possibly even setting them on a track to be sunsetted entirely, as some have proposed or voted on every year. Now, the last time Republicans tried a stunt with the debt ceiling back in 2011, and Lord knows I remember this well, it was mostly about sending a message to Democrats. Now, they threatened to reject a debt ceiling deal. They made a big stink publicly, and then they extracted a bunch of excruciating, painful cuts that genuinely hurt the recovery and hurt America and Americans. But ultimately, they did shake on a deal. I want to announce that the leaders of both parties in both chambers have reached an agreement that will reduce the deficit and avoid default, a default that would have had a devastating effect on our economy. This compromise does make a serious down payment on the deficit reduction we need and gives each party a strong incentive to get a balanced plan done before the end of the year. Most importantly, it will allow us to avoid default and end the crisis that Washington imposed on the rest of America. It wasn't Washington that imposed that crisis. It was the Republicans, though Barack Obama didn't like to say that. That was 11 years ago. So think of this. Is there any reason to believe this Republican Party in a post-Trump world, with Trump watching, with Trump basically acting as a kind of Speaker of the House in absentia, right? Is there any reason to think they would reach an ultimate compromise with Joe Biden to not default? As we said, these Republicans have every incentive to intentionally wreck the economy if it means kneecapping Democrats in 2024. So that's first priority. That's perhaps the most immediate concern with the Republican House. By no means the only one. Number two, they will also cut off military aid to Ukraine. Again, McCarthy openly admitted as much today. Quote, I think people are going to be sitting in a recession. They're not going to want to write blank check to Ukraine. They just won't do it. Now, in terms of the blank check, um, as a percentage of the U.S. defense budget, it's very small. And also keep in mind, the unified bipartisan position on Ukraine is walking a very fine line here. Since the invasion back in February, we provide enough weapons to Ukraine to fight off an unprompted, unjustified invasion in which Russians have been engaged in war crimes, but not so much as to facilitate a conflict that spills over into a war with NATO. Not easy to do. So far, I have to say, the plan seems to be working pretty well. There's peril on either side, believe me. Ukraine is successfully and remarkably not just keeping Russia at bay eight months in the invasion. They've even re-seized captured land. They've taken out hundreds of Russian tanks. It has been one of the most startling and remarkable military performances in recent memory. Kevin McCarthy says he's willing to jeopardize all that. And without U.S. aid, who knows? We may very well see the nightmare scenario of Putin's forces marching into the Ukrainian capital of Kyiv and taking the country by force. By the way, after they did in a what they did in a town like Bukha, what do you think would happen to the Ukrainians there after that? Having said all that, the ultimate priority of a Republican House will be the third thing that we will see. Ukraine, debt ceiling, and that will be public spectacle, painful public spectacle by any means at their disposal. Republicans will almost certainly impeach Joe Biden. Can't predict the future, can't tell you what the odds are. It seems very likely to me. And we know they will because they just keep talking about it. Just yesterday, Congresswoman Elise Stefanik of New York, the third ranking Republican in the House, told the New York Post she is mulling impeaching Biden. 
Well, when there's an egregious abuse of power and high crimes and misdemeanors, that means anything is on the table. If Republicans take the House, Stefanik will be one of the most powerful people in the government. And even Fox News is warning she needs to pump the brakes. Congresswoman Elise Stefanik says Republicans could move to impeach Biden next year. I think that's a rotten idea, Brian. I don't think people want another impeachment fiasco. I'm opposed to it. What do you say? I, I am too. What happens is they vote on partisan lines. The whole country stops for two and a half weeks. And I don't know what any, maybe somebody writes a, a book that a couple of people want to buy. But for the most part, it's a waste of time. An astounding amount of sense there. Now, it would be a waste of time. Uh, but what Brian Kilmeade seems to be missing there is that wasting time is exactly what they're going to want to do. And, and not just that. Think about this, okay? Donald Trump will be the effective House Speaker. They will answer to him. Do you think Joe, Donald Trump wants to see Joe Biden impeached? Of course he does. Are they going to tell Donald Trump no? And here's the thing. It won't end with Biden either. So imagine the following scenario, which again, can't give you odds. I'm not Vegas. I just follow the news closely, and this is what I predict. Imagine a situation where Donald Trump gets indicted by the Department of Justice. I think most people would agree it's at least plausible that could happen. I don't know if likely, but it's a definite possibility. If that were to happen and Republicans control the House, what do you think is going to happen? It seems to me overwhelmingly likely they would move Republicans in the House to immediately impeach Attorney General Merrick Garland in response. In fact, even if Garland doesn't indict Trump, even if the Department of Justice doesn't invite Trump, there will be calls for Garland's impeachment anyway simply because he investigated Trump at all. Just ask, again, I'm not making this up, just ask Marjorie Taylor Greene, the de facto head of the MAGA caucus. I will not stand by and watch Merrick Garland turn the Department of Justice into a political weapon and the FBI sending it after parents that are addressing their school boards, people that walked in the Capitol and have been held in jail for nearly two years while Antifa and BLM riots, rioters go free and are never held accountable. The people she's talking about in jail, those are the insurrectionists, the ones that violently bashed in the brains of cops while we all watched on video, the ones that concussed them, the ones that took their gun, those ones, that's what she's talking about. Green is ready to make good on her threat, and she told my, as she told my next guest, quote, there's going to be a lot of investigations. I've talked with a lot of members about this. And it would be foolish to assume Green would be a, a simple bit player in a Republican-controlled House. In that same interview, she also said Kevin McCarthy would have no choice but to pledge fealty to her, pursue her aggressive governing strategy. Quote, I think that to be the best Speaker of the House and to please the base, he's going to give me a lot of power and a lot of leeway. And if he doesn't, they're going to be very unhappy about it. I think that's the best way to read it. And that's not in any way a threat at all. I just think that's reality. That is what the country, that is what all of us, as citizens, are facing down this November. That is what you are voting for if you vote Republican. It just is. That's, that's what you're going to get. And again, whatever you think about Joe Biden, Democratic Party, they do have a policy agenda. And, and this is the other thing to keep in mind. They genuinely do have a basic political incentive, the most basic political incentive, to try to improve condition, conditions for broad, broad swaths of the country. And even when they don't have the incentive, Democrats still tend to be oriented in that direction. I got to say, do you remember when Donald Trump was president and COVID hit and Democrats were willing to pass the trillions of dollars of spending in the CARES Act and send out stimulus checks, which Trump would then put his name on, ahead of an election in which Trump was standing for re-election? Does anyone really believe that the tables were turned? Republicans would do the same.